Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first press conference at the 235th meeting of the American Astronomical Society here in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm Rick Feinberg. I'm the AAS press officer, and I'm assisted today by our new AAS media fellow, Barani Conchadi, who's sitting in the back. Um, she'll be monitoring the webcast. I want to remind everybody to please turn off or at least silence your cell phones or anything else that makes noise. Uh, there will be, I think it's five press releases going out, might even be six, I'm not sure, but there's at least one press release for each of the four presentations this morning, so if you're on the AAS press list, you'll get a press release, or you'll get those press releases. Um, I have a, a few announcements, actually, since it's the first briefing, uh, I have quite a few announcements, so you'll bear with me for a second. First of all, press registrants. Be alerted to the fact that the National Radio Astronomy Observatory is hosting a press reception this afternoon at 5.30 in this room. Uh, NRAO Director Tony Beasley will be here along with a number of other uh, astronomers and representatives from NRAO uh, just to provide informal updates on, on the latest projects and to answer your questions. And of course, since it's a reception, there will be uh, food and drink. So press registrants, please come. Everybody else, go to the poster session. Um, there's been a little change of plans in the press conference program. Um, we'll put out some messaging about this, but the Tuesday afternoon briefing, which is with representatives from the Mauna Kea Observatories and the 30-meter telescope, um, is not going to be a traditional press conference. It's basically going to be an off-the-record backgrounder, just an opportunity for some frank discussion with the media uh, to prepare them for, to deal with the controversy and, and to, uh, to be able to write about it sensibly. Uh, it's going to be restricted to press registrants, so um, uh, if you're not a press registrant, if you don't have one of those little red ribbons on your badge, uh, you won't be welcome at the 215 briefing on Tuesday. Uh, we're also not going to live stream it. There are, as Megan Donahue mentioned at the morning plenary, lots and lots of opportunities throughout the week to uh, interact with representatives of the observatories. Uh, there are currently, I believe there are some protesters or I should say demonstrators outside the convention center and we may see some more. So you'll have opportunities to interact with people throughout the week if you're not a press registrant. Um, there are three briefings today. The program does not list the one at 12.45. Last time I checked, uh, there is a briefing at 12.45 from the American Institute of Physics uh, in which a task force will unveil results from a study on how to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion in the fields of physics and astronomy. And finally, I want to give a shout out to the University's Space Research Association, USRA. Uh, they provided the refreshments for the press corps that are in the press office. Um, and if you see uh, USRA Public Information Officer Soraya Faruqi around, please thank her for keeping you stoked throughout the week. All right, that's the announcements. So if this is your first press conference at a AAS meeting, and I see a fair number of students here, and I welcome you, uh, let me just tell you how we do it. Um, I will give a brief introduction and I'll introduce all the panelists and then they will speak in order. Um, and it's only at the end of the briefing, after all four have spoken, that we'll take uh, questions and answers. That way we, uh, we take care not to step on the last speaker's time allocation. Um, Off-site journalists who are tuned in via the webcast, um, if you're logged into the text chat, you'll be able to queue your questions up with Tharani and then she'll relay them to us here in the room uh, after we've heard questions from on-site reporters. All right, so this first briefing is themed galaxies and their black holes. Where possible, I try to organize the briefings by a theme so that the stories can mutually reinforce each other. Um, and we have four presenters. Uh, the first will be Amy Rines from Montana State University. Um, she's uh, participated in briefings before uh, because she's uh, at the forefront of the discovery of black holes, uh, massive black holes in little tiny dwarf galaxies. And today she'll be talking about wandering black holes in dwarf galaxies. Then we'll hear from Ezekiel Trister from the Pontifici, I'm not going to get this right, from the University, Catholic University of Chile. We'll just do it in English <laughs> so that I don't make my, a fool of myself. Um, and he's going to speak on molecular gas around black holes in merging galaxies. And then we're going to hear from Bena Holverda from the University of Louisville, who will talk on Hubble observations of a gentle giant spiral galaxy the first of quite a few Hubble-related results appearing this week. And finally, last but not least, James Rhodes from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center will speak about a group of galaxies blowing bubbles at cosmic dawn. And with that, I will turn it over to Amy. 
Oh, I do want to mention also that uh, I want to thank my colleagues at the Astrophysical Journal, one of the AAS journals. Uh, they coordinated with me and with Amy to uh, make sure that Amy's paper, which was in press at the AppJ, appeared online on Friday. So you'll have access to that now. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Amy Rines. I'm a professor at Montana State University in beautiful Bozeman. And today I'm going to tell you about a new and unexpected discovery of wandering massive black holes in dwarf galaxies. So this is an artist's illustration depicting the kind of objects that we found. Here on the left, we have a dwarf galaxy roughly 100 times less massive than our own Milky Way galaxy. It has an irregular morphology, and it looks very different from giant spiral and elliptical galaxies. And this dwarf galaxy has a massive black hole, roughly 100,000 times the mass of our sun. The black hole is accreting or feeding on surrounding gas, which produces observable light, including a jet that's detectable at radio wavelengths. Now, this black hole is wandering around the outskirts of this galaxy, far from the center, and this is not at all what we expected to find. That's because massive black holes are usually found in the centers of galaxies. This is the first image of a black hole that was recently made using the Event Horizon Telescope, and the black hole has a mass of six and a half billion solar masses. In fact, we now know that essentially every giant galaxy, including our Milky Way and M87 shown here, hosts a central black hole with a mass of millions to billions of solar masses. However, the origin of these massive black holes remains a major outstanding issue in modern astrophysics. We don't know how these enormous black holes formed in the first place back in the early history of the universe. We have a fairly good understanding of how black holes and their host galaxies grow over time through accretion and mergers, but we don't know how these black holes got their start. In other words, we don't know how massive the black hole seeds were when they first formed. To address this question, I've been spending the past several years searching for and studying massive black holes in nearby dwarf galaxies. Dwarf galaxies host the smallest known black holes, and therefore they place the most concrete observational limits on the masses of the first black hole seeds. While we've made a lot of progress in recent years using optical spectroscopy, these searches have a number of limitations. For example, they're only sensitive to the most actively feeding black holes, in the nuclei of dwarf galaxies with relatively low amounts of star formation. Therefore, these optically selected black holes are likely just the tip of the iceberg. Radio observations offer another avenue to search for massive black holes in dwarf galaxies and broaden the parameter space of the detectable population. In other words, there is a lot of potential for new discoveries. And this was highlighted by my discovery of a massive black hole in the dwarf starburst galaxy Hanais 210 a number of years ago. This was a serendipitous discovery aided by the use of high resolution radio observations and it marked an entirely new environment in which to find a massive black hole. And this discovery provided much of the motivation to conduct the radio survey that's the focus of my presentation today. Recently, I have completed this radio survey of dwarf galaxies in a search for massive black holes. This is the first survey of its kind, and as Rick mentioned, it was just published in the Astrophysical Journal. I obtained observations of 111 dwarf galaxies with the Very Large Array Radio Telescope in New Mexico, and I chose to observe these particular dwarf galaxies because they were previously detected in the faint images of the radio sky at 20 centimeters, or first radio survey that was conducted between 1993 and 2011. However, due to the relatively low angular resolution of the first survey, the origin of this radio mission was unclear. It could be from massive black holes, but it could also just be from intense star formation in these dwarf galaxies. 
my new VLA observations have a much higher angular resolution than first, and they're also much more sensitive. Therefore, these new observations can help distinguish between black holes and star formation as the origin of the radio emission. And we found 13 dwarf galaxies containing massive black holes. The optical images of the galaxies shown here are from the Dark Energy Camera Legacy Survey, and the red crosses indicate the position of the radio emission coming from the accreting or feeding massive black holes. And you can see that the black holes are not always at the center of their host galaxy. And I was very surprised when I first saw this. All of the black holes that we've been finding previously in dwarf galaxies had been located in galaxy nuclei. Some of the host dwarf galaxies here do not even possess obvious centers. Some of them have irregular morphologies and they show signs of interactions and mergers. Uh, and while this was very surprising from an observational standpoint, recent simulations actually predict that roughly half of all massive black holes in dwarf galaxies are expected to be off-center, uh, wandering around in the outskirts of their host galaxies. And again, this artist's illustration nicely portrays what we think is going on. So these off-center black holes probably result from interactions or mergers between two smaller dwarf galaxies, where at least one of the progenitor dwarf galaxies had a massive black hole that got flung out uh, during the merger. Alternatively, an off-nuclear black hole could result from being ejected by gravitational radiation recoil, recoil excuse me, uh, during the coalescence of two black holes brought in by a dwarf-dwarf merger. In any case, once a black hole leaves a dwarf galaxy nucleus, it may never return. Uh, and this is why we think these off-center black holes may be somewhat common in dwarf galaxies. And this is in contrast to giant galaxies that have much more massive black holes that can more easily sink back down to the galaxy nucleus. Okay, so I will just recap. Uh, we use the VLA to search for radio signatures of massive black holes in dwarf galaxies. We discovered 13 dwarfs hosting black holes with masses averaging around a few hundred thousand solar masses. We were very surprised to find that the black holes were not always in the galaxy centers. However, this result is consistent with computer simulations predicting that roughly half of all black holes and dwarfs should be wandering around in the outskirts of their host galaxies. And finally, this work indicates that we must broaden our searches beyond dwarf galaxy nuclei to constrain the formation of massive black holes. Thank you. Well, hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Ezekiel Treister. I'm a professor at Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, so quite a bit far away from here. Um, and today I, will, I have the pleasure of presenting the first unprecedented uh, results of ALM observations of the cold molecular gas in, um, in the central regions of, of merging galaxies. And in particular, I'm going to talk about one specific system that is called NGC 6240, 6240. Now, I find 6240 to be a fascinating system. You can see the, the Hubble image right here is about 400 million light years away, so relatively nearby, and that allows us to study in great details, which is essentially what I will be presenting today. And I call it a system because it's not one galaxy, but it's actually two galaxies that are merging, that are in the process of merging or colliding one with another. Now, each nucleus, uh, just as Amy was describing before, contains a, a few hundred million solar masses black holes, and in this particular case, both black holes are actively growing at the, at the same time. It's also in a very unique stage because not only the black holes are growing, but also in the system, 
there's very significant current star formation. The star formation rate is approximately 100 solar masses per year. Just to give you a reference, that's about 100 times more than, than in the Milky Way, just for example. And what we did in this system is to study the cold molecular gas. And the reason why we did that is because it, it's the fuel for both uh, star formation and black hole growth. So we are understanding what is fueling these processes that we are observing happening simultaneously in this system. So just to give you an idea, these are the previous observations of, that we had of this, of this system. This, this, this is such a, again, a fascinating system that was observed for 20, 30 years. These were some of the images of the molecular gas that we had before ALMA. We can see that uh, most of the molecular gas is found in between the two nuclei that are pointed as the, the northern and the southern nucleus. And in total, we found about 9 million solar masses of, uh, of gas in the central region. And again, just for, for reference, this is about 13 times more molecular gas than in the whole Milky Way. Now, you are going to see, well, for the first time publicly, the ALM observations of this system which is this one, is of, uh, an increase in a factor of 10 in spatial resolution. The only reason why we were able to obtain this image is thanks to the unique capabilities of ALMA using a, a new, uh, new setup that allows to separate the antennas by 15 kilometers, and that allows us to essentially go for the equivalent of being legally blind at 2200 vision to essentially have perfectly normal 2020 vision. Or just to give you another reference, this is equivalent to be able to see a football field at the distance of the moon. And basically, this is what allow us to gain this as the observation before, and this is what we get now. Now, with ALMA, we don't only have information. We don't we don't only have an image, but we actually have what we call a cube. We also have velocity information. So what we can know, we can do that now is go through the data cube that we obtain with ALMA. So these are the combining the ALMA and HST observation of the central region. You can clearly see the two nuclei, the north and the and the south black holes. And now we are looking at the at the molecular gas traced by the CO molecule. And you can see essentially there's a filament connecting both nuclei that clearly that you can clearly separate from the rest of the mission in the nuclear region. I'm going to quickly play it again so that we can see it again. And because this is a cube in velocity, the, the structures that we see separate from the from this filament are actually separate in velocity, and what we find them, these are, mo these are molecular outflows at velocities greater than 500 kilometers per second that are being expelled from the central region of the system by a combination of the, of the emission from star formation and the black hole grow activity. So these are basically some of our main results, basically thanks to this unprecedented resolution, we can see, we can study in more detail than ever before the structure of the molecular gas in the system, finding this filament connecting the two nuclei, this, this uh, ejected material. Uh, and we found, we can also study the gas that is readily available to feed both black holes, finding in total about four billion solar masses of molecular gas that are bench that are basically available to feed both uh, supermassive black holes. Now, to put it a little bit in, in context, we caught uh, 60 to 40 in the particular, particular initial and short-lived stage. We think that this is likely a transient structure that is generated by the merger of the two galaxies that probably will last for something like 10 million years, which is very short over the lifetime of the merger of the galaxies, which might take about two, 2 billion years. And so we were particularly lucky to be observing the system in this particular stage. And in fact, if we look at many other uh, galaxy mergers, we're probably not going to see a configuration like this. And this whole process is important because it's analogous that was to what will happen to, to the collision between the Milky Way and Andromeda in something like uh, 5 billion years. So just to summarize, the article was recently accepted uh, on January 2nd uh, by publication in the Astrophysical Journal. It will appear on, on uh, the archive tonight, well, 
uh, in a few hours Hawaii time, but you can access all the material, all the graphics and animations, and a copy of the, of the article at the, at the address you can find there. So thank you very much. Hello, um, I'm uh, Ben Holverda, I'm from the University of Louisville in Kentucky, uh, and I'll talk to you about um, a very particular galaxy, uh, UGC 2885, which really rolls off the tongue. Uh, so our nickname for that has become uh, Vera Rubin's Galaxy, and um, I'll talk to you about the one half of this project, which was to generate a pretty picture of that galaxy with Hubble. Uh, and if you want to contact me, those are my, uh, that's my information. So, uh, who's, who's Vera Rubin, on the chance that you might not know? Um, so, she published one of two um, t uh, articles uh, now 40 years ago, um, revealing uh, evidence for dark matter in uh, nearby galaxies. Uh, and uh, there is another part to her which she in encouraged and supported young scientists throughout her, uh, her career. She's quite well known for, no well known for that. So, um, yeah, and she passed away about three years ago. Um, and so this is the results that she's known for. Uh, galaxies rotate, but how do they rotate? Do they rotate like, um, and we used to say, like a gramophone, but nobody knows what that is anymore. Um, so do they rotate like a disk, like a solid wheel, or do they rotate like the planets do, where they drop off? Uh, the further you go, the, the, the slower the planets actually go, so like a Kepler found. Uh, and they actually do something in between. It's kind of the speed stays roughly the same. So. Um, do they, are they like, I figured more people actually throw clay than actually listen to gramophones. Um, <clears throat> and um, so they don't rotate as, as, um, as, a, as a solid disk and they don't rot rotate like the planets, but there's something in between which implies that there's lots of extra mass at higher radii. And uh, so she published one um, article showing that for a few galaxies and this galaxy was among them. And then uh, because the other group in the Westerbork radio telescope um, with Albert Bosman, uh, Peter van der Kruijt, and Ron Allen, uh, they found uh, that the rotation for a different set of galaxies also looked like that. Of course, instantly everybody felt, followed everybody else up and to see if we, we didn't do anything wrong. So the this is the nice way science works. You have two different methods and you both see the same thing and then you start believing that there's something wrong with the way galaxies move. Um, and so uh, they follow this up as well. So this is nice flat rotation curve. So this is uh, radius, meaning as soon as you go from the inside, to the outside of the galaxy, and how fast is things are, is gas and stars whizzing by. Now she wrote this other paper in 1980 that uh, because there was such a big result in January, I think that that's the paper that everybody thinks of. But there's this one other paper where she shows this this particular plot. Um, where she notes that this one galaxy is really big, just unusually big. And um, the thing that I noticed, I was reading this paper, uh, it's all, and I noticed that all the other galaxies have been observed with Hubble, and this one hadn't. So why not take a good, pretty picture with, with Hubble from this galaxy? Um, and so that's what we did. That was our first goal. Um, so we have a very, very pretty picture, but of course we wanted to do some science with the very, very pretty picture. Um, it's really a mystery how you can grow a galaxy that big and keep it a neat disk. The way bigger galaxies grow is by merging with other galaxies, and then they should, shouldn't look this neat. Um, and so we were going to look for the, we are going to, we're looking at the globular cluster population, the star cluster population, which should be the leftover of any merger, early, early, early mergers, and to see the age distribution of these clusters of stars, and uh, also to see what the uh, what age distribution of the young stellar clusters are. And so that you can do with Hubble, because you can distinguish whether or not a cluster is, um, is actually, um, a background, is, is that little fuzzy thing a background galaxy or not? Is it a foreground star? So you may notice that there's a really bright thing there that's not a black hole or a supernova going off. That's just a ho-hum star in our own Milky Way. Uh, and so there's lots of other uh, stuff in the way as well. And so the neat thing about Hubble is that we now can distinguish which ones, how many globular clusters are, are there. And so uh, there's many studies for the other Hubble mosaics. And so we have a good comparison set as well. So. We had an excellent scientific reason to make a, a very, very pretty picture. 
Um, and so that was the, uh, that's the motivation. So how do you grow a giant like that? Uh, it's, it's so much more massive. It's 10 to the 12 solar masses, which is usually you see only um, elliptical galaxies there. So the question is how, you, how do you grow a disk? How do you grow a disk this neatly? Um, and uh, so we see a range of, of, um, of global cluster ages, and we see relatively few of them. So that implies that this has just gently grown by the accretion of gas, not by in ingesting its neighbor violently. Uh, and and that's, that's where we are now. And so we're releasing the picture today, and it is uh, also on one of the big um, uh, displays yeah. in the hallway. So uh, yeah, I'm very excited about that. So. And uh, we don't name galaxies, but we have a few nicknames, so I hope the nickname Rubens Galaxy is going to, to stick. So, thank you. So when was the last time that a typical ordinary hydrogen atom did anything interesting on a Saturday night, like going to a party and getting ionized? <laughs> well, it turns out that um, because most of the hydrogen in the universe still lives in the space between galaxies, that for a typical hydrogen atom, the last time it did anything unusual was way back in the period we call cosmic dawn when the first starlight from the first galaxies converted that hydrogen from neutral gas to ionized gas. I'm James Rhodes from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and today I'm going to tell you about a new observation that sheds light on the conditions in the universe at the time that this happened by looking at a group of galaxies at that period in cosmic history and seeing it in the act of ionizing the surrounding gas. So to put this in context, I wanted to show a perhaps familiar sketch of cosmic history. And that goes from the Big Bang to the present day. And the period that we're talking about is in between the Dark Ages and the Cosmic Dawn, fairly early in this timeline. And in the last decade, astronomers have made a lot of progress in understanding the history of this. And we know now that this process began something like half a billion years after the Big Bang with the first galaxies forming and continued for perhaps another half billion years to the, um, the billion year mark in cosmic history. But in that period, this important transition happened where we went from neutral gas to ionize. And it's somewhat akin to a frozen lake melting in the spring. The material is there. It's the same set of atoms. But they've changed their physical conditions. They've changed their properties in a way that hasn't gone back in the subsequent 13 billion years. And we have a number of you know, calculations and simulations of how this process proceeded. This is one example. This animation shows ionized bubbles growing throughout that period of time as the first galaxies turn on and begin to emit light that can disrupt the hydrogen around them in this sweeping global change. But there are many models possible, and what we need is observations to constrain those models to tell us what really happened among those possibilities. And looking for bubbles like these ones that you see on the screen is a great way to do that. And as time goes by, incidentally, the bubbles grow and eventually merge and take us from that early universe, all neutral hydrogen, to conditions like the present day universe when that hydrogen is essentially all ionized everywhere throughout the universe. Now, we need a tool to try to look for this. And the tool we've chosen is something called Lyman Alpha. It's a particular kind of light, um, a particular wavelength of light. It's produced plentifully by young galaxies. And Lyman-alpha has the property that before 
the universe was ionized, um, the light scatters like headlights in a fog, which makes it hard to see Lyman alpha light from the early period before the universe was reionized. If you wait a little while till reionization has completed, you should be able to see that light clearly. It's like the ionization of the gas has cleared the fog, and now you can see those headlights. So by looking for Lyman alpha from galaxies, we can determine if their surroundings are neutral or ionized. And this illustration basically shows two dots that have the same amount of light in them. One of them has been spread out and scattered like that headlight in fog. It's very hard to see that. Once you've cleared that fog, the source appears smaller, compact, and much easier to pick up. So we've gone looking for galaxies like that. The work I'm talking about today comes from something called the Cosmic Dawn Survey, which we pursued using the four-meter telescope at the Kitt Peak National Observatory. And in order to um, find these bubbles in the early universe, the first ones are rare. So that means you need a wide field of view. And additionally, you're looking very far back in time to very distant galaxies. That means they're faint, so you need a sensitive observation. And finally, studying cosmic dawn is best done at infrared wavelengths. So what we needed was a, a wide field of view on a big telescope with infrared capability, and that's what we've used here. We used it to look for Lyman alpha light from galaxies in the epoch of cosmic dawn. And the ones that looked the most promising, we followed up with spectra from the Keck telescope on Mauna Kea here in Hawaii. And um, I will be showing you now a picture of the, the most interesting corner of the Cosmic Dawn survey. So this is probably under a percent of the full survey area of Cosmic Dawn. And what you see here is the background image is a color composite from the Hubble Space Telescope, which gives us better um, spatial resolution. But those circles mark the location of three galaxies that have the properties we expect for cosmic dawn galaxies. So this panel here now shows three, uh, three objects, and for each one, five colors of light. So a column in this image is a color. The middle column shows the image from the Kitt Peak National Observatory, and that's taken with a, a filter that passes a small range of wavelength that's tuned to identify Lyman alpha from this time when the universe was 5% of its current age. Um, on the left-hand side of the image, you see bluer light from the Hubble Space Telescope, and the expectation if the galaxies are truly that far away is they shouldn't turn up in those blue images, whereas the redder images on the right, they should be there, but they're fainter, and that's what we see. So these three galaxies have the properties that we expect for cosmic dawn galaxies. And now I want to put this in the context of that cosmic history snapshot. So you'll see here the little turn on of that ionized bubble, and we've marked the approximate point in cosmic history where EGS 77, as we've named the group, is found. And now we're going to fly in, going past the foreground galaxies towards the early universe, using our telescope as a time machine. And as we go back to the back, you see this artist's conception. The, um, the galaxies are shown in much greater detail than we can presently observe at these distances. But, um, what you see around them is this sort of sphere of glowing ionized gas that represents the ionized region that we infer must be present from the fact that we see the Lyman alpha light from each of these three galaxies, both in the Kitt Peak images and in the spectra from Keck. And this now shows how that region of ionization maps into the region of the, um, the Dawn survey images. So, to recap, then, reionization was the last time that anything interesting happened in the life of a typical hydrogen atom, and it's important to understand that history. We found an ionized bubble back when the universe was 5% of its current age, indicated by the presence of these three galaxies, all with detected Lyman alpha light. Um, it sheds new light on cosmic dawn, and going forward, we're very excited to look ahead to the capabilities of the James Webb Space Telescope, which we will use to study the individual galaxies within this group and perhaps find fainter ones, and also the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope, WFIRST, which will have the, the broad coverage in order needed to find more objects like this. Thank you.
Thank you all very much. We had four really clear presentations with some terrific graphics. That's always a good way to start a press conference program at a AAS meeting. Uh, all right, so we're going to take uh, questions now for the panelists. Uh, we'll start here in the room. Uh, yeah, raise your hand, and when I call on you, identify yourself, uh, tell us who you are and uh, who you write for. Um, and if you are on the webcast and you've logged into the chat, please queue up your questions, and then uh, Tharani Conchati will relay them to us um, in a few minutes. All right, so let's get started. I saw one hand down here and one hand over here, so we'll start with you. It certainly could be. Um, it would be very difficult to detect them, however, because they're probably not going to be accreting very much, and that's how we see them. They have to be producing observable radiation, but if you have a black hole that's just by itself that got flung out out of the galaxy, um, it might not have a lot of material with it, and so they would be hard to find. But it is possible that some of them, at least for some amount of time, could hang on to some material or some stars around them and possibly detect that. How would you determine whether it was black matter or a black hole in front as a foreground for something behind it? That would be really difficult. So it dep you would need some kind of redshift information um, from optical spectroscopy, for example. You would need that. And actually, that is something that I was able to do with my galaxies. Uh, the dwarf galaxies, some of them had optical spectra from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and I basically see that the most luminous radio sources have an enhanced uh, emission line ratio from of O1 to H alpha, suggesting the, the line emission is actually um, coming from the same galaxies where the radio sources are. Um, so we have considered background obje objects in, in my study, um, and I think we've ruled those out. Okay, Ethan. Hi, this is Ethan Siegel from Starts with a Bang in Forbes. Uh, my first question is for uh, Dr. Rines. I, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation, and you talked about how um, these off-center black holes likely arise from mergers or interactions, that that's, that's the scenario that simulations predict should lead to them. I was wondering, when you look at these galaxies in the optical, you know, you see a mix of galaxies that have the black holes at the center and galaxies that have the black holes off center, is there a correlation between the morphology and irregularity of the dwarfs themselves and the off-centeredness of the black hole? There is. This is demonstrated in the paper. So the galaxies that tend to have more regular morphologies and have well-defined nuclei tend to have their black holes sitting right in the nucleus, as you would expect. But the galaxies that look more disturbed, um, showing signs of interactions or mergers, the black holes are more offset in those cases, which is consistent with the scenario of mergers producing the offset black holes. So it, it does look like that's what's happening. Other questions? Do we have any on the webcast yet? Uh, nothing from the chat currently. Nothing? OK. Well, then uh, I will ask a few questions. There's one over here. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, wait for the mic, and wait for the mic, and, and thanks to Christine Pulliam from Space Telescope to, uh, um, handling the mic. A, a, a Jim Manning consultant, also from Bozeman. Oh. Um, a, a question for Amy. Um, what is the smallest of the dwarf galaxy black holes you found, and why do you feel you need to look beyond dwarf galaxy black holes to further constrain the size of black hole seeds? Okay, so the smallest galaxies where we're finding massive black holes are, um, I think it was around three times 10 to the eight solar masses. So equivalent to the small Magellanic Cloud, or a little bit less, um, which is a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way. So these are among the smallest galaxies where we've found massive black holes. We don't have great estimates for the masses of the black holes, um, but using some scaling relations, on average, there are a few hundred thousand solar masses. Um, and in terms of constraining seed formation with dwarf galaxies, um, I, I think what I was trying to say is that we want to continue to look at dwarf galaxies, but not just at their nuclei. We need to expand our searches and look throughout the whole galaxy since a significant fraction of the galaxies might host black holes that are offset from the nucleus. 
Okay, we'll come back to Ethan. Hey, this is a question for uh, Dr. Huerta. I, um, I thought this was a really interesting scenario and a really interesting galaxy, and I was wondering, being this physically large in extent, being this you know, massive for a spiral galaxy, and having this few globular clusters in it, um, do the globular clusters also show a consistent color and age as one another? And are there any nearby large masses that could possibly be causing these spiral arms to be larger and display this grand spiral structure that's extended the way we sometimes see? Okay, so two-part question. Um, the globular clusters show a range of uh, colors and uh, therefore ages and metallicities. Uh, and so it looks like they just formed over a long period of time. So it's not like uh, there was a, there's, there's a grouping from as, as one ar uh, galaxy was ingested a long time ago. Um, you, you can still, a, a large disk can survive uh, an encounter with a medium-sized galaxy. There, we see that in the, in, at higher redshifts. It's, these are called super spirals. Uh, but they inevitably have a second nucleus or, or very perturbed, very clearly perturbed uh, morphology. It's actually strange that this galaxy has, uh, is almost perfectly symmetric as far as we can tell. Uh, it, it keeps going. Uh, there is very low level star formation from inside the disk all the way out. The globular cluster and the cluster population looks very similar to M83, for example, which is 100 times lighter but also has a big H1 disk, big gas disk, and a big, uh, with, with star formation uh, throughout. Um, but it is strange to see something that big still doing what M33 is doing. So, um, and as far as I can tell, it is fairly lonely in the universe, so it's not been perturbed by anything nearby. Okay, any, uh, okay, we'll take one from Allison here. Hi, I'm Allison Klussman from Astronomy Magazine. Um, I have a question for James Rhodes. Um, so when, you, when you're looking at these bubbles around the galaxies, what does that actually tell you about Cosmic Dawn? What do you hope to learn from that? Okay, it's a good question. Um, so the observation of Lyman Alpha around one galaxy gives us an indication that there must be a region of ionized gas that's at least something like three million light years in radius. That's about what it takes for the, the Lyman Alpha light that comes out of the galaxy to act like it's in an, a fully ionized universe rather than a partially ionized one. And if you look at how many galaxies there are where you see the Lyman Alpha, you can start to do a census of what part of the universe must be ionized. So what we do by doing this at different epochs in cosmic history is to um, sort of map out the progress of reionization. Um, and I wanted to just mention, since I forgot um, at the end of my talk, our results are also expected on AstroPH in the next uh, 24 hours or so. Tilvi is the lead author on the paper that's coming out. I also wanted to give a shout out to my collaborator, Sangeet Himalhotra, who's right here in the room, um, co collaborator on all of this work for many, many years. And both she and I will be around at the meeting to take questions one on one if they don't turn up here. Any uh, questions in from the chat? Uh, nothing yet. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a question for uh, Ezekiel Trister. Um, I just wanted to make sure I understood uh, a couple of things. First of all, when you say the, the black holes are growing, w what is it that you're looking at that's telling you that they're growing? And by growing, I assume you mean they're accreting more mass. Right? That's right. Uh, so the evidence that, that we have for the growth of the black hole actually doesn't come from this data. It comes primarily from the X-ray detection. So we see, the, 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 we see emission, very high energy emission that is coming from both uh, nuclei separately, and that's the indication that we have for the actual growth. And something that is important is that if we look at the actual growth and we calculate how much matter is actually falling into the black hole right now, it's actually a very small fraction of the total available material. So potentially the black holes can continue growing for a very long time and in, in at a much faster rate than they currently are. And uh, I, I'm not sure if I, there was one thing I, w I was a little confused about. Uh, you mentioned that th this molecular gas is flowing between, uh, the molecular glass gas between the two 
uh, black holes is flowing, but I, I wasn't clear, is it flowing out of the black holes toward the middle or from the middle out to the black holes? Well, actually, that's one of the sort of surprises that we found uh, with this data, because with lower resolution data, people didn't quite know what the gas was doing. If I sh showed the image that wasn't very clear. So what we see now with the high resolution ALMA data is that there's a filament connecting the two nuclei, but it seems to be, there's not a very well-defined movement, organized movement of that filament. So the answer to that question is, it's, ha it's somewhat in there in between the two nuclei, but as, as I was saying, I, we think that this is a very unstable situation, and if we probably go back and look at this system in a few million years, it will be very different. I look forward to that. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, a question for uh, Amy Rines, too. Um, so you said that, it, that you were surprised to find uh, so many of these black holes off-center from the galaxies, but that uh, simulations predict it. And so my question is, had, were those simulations done after the observations or before? And if before, why were you surprised? <laughs> right, so they were done before by Jillian Balberry, who is right here. Um, I think I was, I mean, in retrospect, it's not super surprising that you would get these uh, black holes flung out from mergers. Um, but just based on all of the observations that I had done and all of the other black holes that I had found in dwarf galaxies, they were always, as best we could tell, right in the nucleus. So it was just, um, yeah, it was just a, a new discovery that we weren't really expecting to find. And you said that, the, uh, that these observations were done with the VLA. Yes. And that you got higher resolution and higher sensitivity than the earlier survey that was also done with the VLA. So right. can you just uh, explain how it is that you had you know, higher sensitivity, higher resolution with the same instrument? Right, so the VLA, um, it's an interferometer, so it's in a, a Y shape. There's 27 radio antennae, and it's like a zoom lens. It can go in and out, and depending on the configuration, you can get uh, higher resolution. So I use the most extended configuration to get the highest resolution. Um, in first, the, uh, the resolution was about five arc seconds, I believe, and mine were about a quarter of an arc second, so that's a pretty big jump. Um, and you can get more sensitive observations just by staring at something longer mm -hmm. for more time. Um, and so that's what I did. Okay, great. Any other questions here in the room? Aha, we have one over here <laughs> from Kala. Uh, Kala Cofield with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Dr. Rhodes, I was just wondering if um, with these uh, three galaxies, you're able to say anything yet about um, the timing of Cosmic Dawn, if you can infer anything about the, you know, the state um, that Cosmic Dawn would have been in with these galaxies, and if that matches up you know, with the redshift and what you expect. Okay, so um, I think to get a, you know, a full answer on what fraction of cosmic of reionization was complete at the redshift where we're working, we probably need to do a bit for a further analysis on the Dawn survey data. I do want to give a shout out to uh, a postdoc working with us, Isaac Wald, who's reporting on results from a s another survey, the Lager survey, at a slightly lower redshift, just about 50 million years later than the Dawn survey observations. Um, and he's going to be presenting um, results that include measurements at just a little bit later when we're finding that the neutral fraction is maybe in the 30% range, give or take 15. So it's going to be higher than that for redshift 7.7, .7, but I don't have a quantitative answer until we've done more analysis on the full Dawn survey data set. Can you um, comment on uh, how the redshift of these galaxies that you found uh, or that you measured uh, compares with you know, some of the previous record holders for most distant galaxies? Okay. so. Um, if we put these three galaxies in the, the Wikipedia table of most distant galaxies, I believe they the all The most authoritative land, one, right? Yeah, the absolute authoritative list. But, you know, <laughs> hey, I've been a professor. I've told students, don't use Wikipedia as your final source, but it's an awfully fast first source. All of them land in the top 10 in that list. Um, there are several that have higher redshifts, but this is the first time that we have a group of galaxies all showing strong Lyman alpha, all with spectroscopic confirmation, and that's what tells us that we're seeing reionization in progress. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? 
All right. Tharani, anything online? Nothing in the chat. Oh, it's quiet out there beyond the islands. <laughs> okay. Well, that being the case, we'll wrap it up a little bit early. I want to thank, first of all, our speakers for their uh, very interesting presentations, their excellent slides and animations, and their uh, willingness to be here this morning and uh, participate in this briefing. Thank all of you in the audience and those of you online, even though you're not typing much. Um, <laughs> and uh, I want to remind you again that there are uh, two more briefings today. The, uh, the next briefing will be um, at 12.45 in this room. It's called Team Up for Physics and Astronomy. And it, again, it's about a uh, new report from the American Institute of Physics on how to improve uh, diversity, equity, and, inclu and inclusion in the physics and astronomy professions. Um, there were press releases distributed, uh, and there will be press releases, or at least a press release, uh, for the one this afternoon as well. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you back here in a couple hours. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>